For those of you who are here today and those who uh, might be watching this on a tape or hearing a lecture, um, I would like to just make reference to three books from which these talks basically in a way are drawn. Uh, one is Dancing Alone, uh, which is subtitled The Quest for Orthodox Faith in the Age of False Religion. And that book deals with a critique of uh, Protestantism within the United States as we know it today. And the second half offers the Orthodox Church as an alternative. Another book is uh, a novel by the title of Portofino. Uh, and that is a story about a child growing up in a Protestant fundamentalist missionary family. It's a work of humor, but it has a serious side to it. And that is that often as people grow up in the Protestant culture, there comes a day when they realize that there is a bigger world of Christianity out there and that somehow their involvement with the historic church has been cut off somewhere and they have now uh, really been brought up in a, an environment uh, that while being well-meaning and often uh, wonderful and warm in its presentation of the gospel, nevertheless uh, leaves something to be desired, whether that's in the area of worship or sacramentality. And my novel, Portofino, is really a story about that uh, from the point of view of a child set in a very different uh, place, which happens to be Portofino, Italy, where his family goes on vacation. The third book, which has a lot to do with tonight's talk, uh, is really a critique of the American situation that confronts us as Orthodox Christians today. Or to put it another way, it's about contemporary orthodoxy. And that's called Letters to Father Aristotle, A Journey Through Contemporary American Orthodoxy. And that really comes out of my own experience in gatherings such as this with the kind of questions that perplex Orthodox Christians. And so those three taken together form the kind of footnotes, if you like, the basis from which these three talks are drawn. Having said that, uh, I would like to begin today's session by, first of all, saying something to my Protestant friends who are here with me this morning. One thing that I think you should know before I say another word today is this. We Protestants, the background that I come from, often think of all matters to do with Christianity and the church as issues of salvation. What do I mean by that? We tend to think of things in terms of black and white. You are in or you are out. You are saved or you are lost. That being the case, there are a lot of Protestants who sometimes hear me speak who misunderstand what I am saying because they assume that when one talks about the historic church and orthodoxy, that one is saying somehow implicitly, even if you don't say it with your mouth, that if you're not in the historical church, if you're not an Orthodox Christian, you are lost. You are not saved. Now, I would like to say at the outset today that in the course of these three talks, I am going to be making a critique of certain aspects of Protestant Christianity in particular, Western Christianity in general, and our contemporary situation. Nowhere in that critique do I mean to imply that because I am making a critique of Western Christianity, that there are no Christians in Protestantism or Roman Catholicism that are not sincerely seeking God, that are not sincerely finding their salvation, that are not sincerely followers of Christ. And one of the things that the historic church teaches is that salvation is a mystery and that only God can see the heart. And we see in the church's tradition from the very beginning with, for instance, the story of the thief on the cross who neither had a Protestant, quote, born-again experience nor was baptized and chrismated in the sacramental sense and yet was promised the kingdom of God by Christ himself. And as a monk on Mount Athos once told me, the last thing the thief on the cross stole was salvation. <laughs> because he certainly... He certainly did not do it by the book on anyone's reckoning. And one can also think of the Roman centurion with the disciples and the apostles who became the founders of the church standing right next to Christ. Christ looked at this Roman who was neither a Jew nor a Christian as far as we know. And he said, here is the greatest faith 
that I have found in Israel. So when it comes to matters of salvation, only God can be the judge. We each walk by the light we are given. A critique of modern Protestantism is not, therefore, by extension, me pointing the finger at someone and saying, therefore, you are lost. Nor is the reverse true. The Orthodox Church is indeed the historic church, and we will be talking about that today. But by no means is there some magical guarantee that just because someone is either born into the historic church or goes there or is a big donor to their local parish, whatever, does that mean that in the eyes of God they are on the path of salvation? Because the teaching of the historic church is, again, that only God sees the heart. And I like to say that very clearly today because in the rough and tumble of discussion and in my talks on the historic church and my critique of Protestantism, I do not want anyone to implicitly finish the sentence, as it were, and say something that I'm not saying. And that is, oh, he must be saying, therefore, everyone outside of the church is lost and everyone somehow in it is magically saved. There is a difference between discussing what the church is and the individual heart of the person. There is a difference between recognizing there is such a thing as a historic church and therefore drawing the extension and saying, and unless you are here, here, and here in the church, chrismated, whatever it might be, you are condemned. Because we are taught through the church's tradition and through the scripture that this is simply not the case. Things are not that simple. Only God sees the heart. To, to whom much is given, much is required, we are told. We each walk by the light we are given. So I would like to open my remarks today in general for all three talks with that statement. For myself, my own journey to orthodoxy did not begin with a search for the orthodox church. I did not suddenly become aware of the orthodox church by someone giving me a book or by me wandering into a church off the street and became, uh, becoming fascinated with the iconography or the liturgy or something like that and then wanting to find out about it. That is the journey that many people have made to orthodoxy. It was not mine. My journey to the Orthodox Church began, you might say, though from a Christian point of view, of course, one doesn't believe in coincidence, but from a human point of view, coincidentally, I backed into the Orthodox Church, as it were, discovered myself in it, and then tried to figure out what I was doing there. Um, I did not uh, come in from uh, the point of view of a frontal approach. And so uh, my story perhaps is a little different than those of some people uh, that you would hear who made a theological uh, kind of a quest for orthodoxy, um, knew all about it, had studied it, kind of lined all their ducks up in a row and made a decision. So today, when I talk about my journey to orthodoxy, you have to understand that in a way, I come from a point of view of being as surprised by the Orthodox Church and enlightened uh, uh, and overjoyed by it, almost like someone who stumbles across a great treasure and only later figures out exactly what they are doing there. And so in 2020 hindsight, I kind of lay things out in a row that makes it sound as if it was much more a mental or intellectual journey than it really was. My own journey began, I guess, uh, back in my childhood because I was raised in an evangelical Protestant Christian family that took its Christianity very, very seriously. My father, the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer, and my mother, Edith Schaeffer, founded a small Protestant community called Le Brie Fellowship back in the early 1950s in Switzerland. And that's where I grew up. I grew up in a Christian retreat center. The hallmark of Libri was that Christianity, Christian ideas, the idea that Christianity presents a reasonable solution to the problems of modern man, this was the bedrock upon which my own childhood faith was built. You know how it is when we're children, we all take for granted the environment we're in. If you're the son of a surgeon, you know that uh, uh, the phone rings in the middle of the night and dad has to run off to the emergency room and you never think this is odd or different. Uh, if you are the son of a 
plumber you don't expect your dad to have clean fingernails all the time you kind of grow up thinking that all dads must have grime under their fingernails at the end of the day and only later do you find out that there are other ways to earn your living and that not everyone's dad is a plumber well for me my background what seemed natural was long meal table conversations with theologians and philosophically inclined young people and others and through our family uh, many, many people would come uh, to Christianity, and many Christians would visit. And so I grew up knowing people like Billy Graham and all those other, quote, famous American evangelicals who would come on little pilgrimages and retreats and stop by our home. And for me, what was normal, quote, unquote, was to sit through a long meal table conversation with my dad talking to someone like Billy Graham or whoever it might be about all kinds of theological matters. It was only later that I found out that lunch or dinner uh, did not always have to be three hours long and uh, involve uh, a weighty discussion of Karl Barth or Paul Tillich or other modern theologians and what they meant and what the World Council of Churches was doing or not doing and what Vatican II meant and so forth and so on. Later I found out that uh, you were free just to sit down and eat and, uh, and, uh, and leave. I didn't know <laughs> that, uh, but as a child I thought this is what dinner was. So for me, my background was intensely religious, uh, philosophical. Ideas were the currency in which my family traded, if you want to put it that way. As a result, as I grew up and went into my own work as a writer and author and uh, in the arts, it, particularly in the area of film and directing in both the secular community, directing feature films, and in the religious community, the evangelical subculture wherein I made series such as Whatever Happened to the Human Race with Dr. C. Everett Koop and How Should We Then Live and these types of things, I carried that baggage, that seriousness of Christianity with me. And so I kind of set a fairly high standard for myself of what I wanted out of this faith. I expected a lot. I thought that it ought to really give answers. And so I was kind of a perennial seeker, a searcher after truth, you might say. Not because of any particular uh, Christian or, or uh, spiritual quality to myself, uh, simply because this is the environment I grew up in, and so it seemed natural to me to keep asking questions and looking for honest answers. One of the questions I started to ask myself about 15 years ago was why, for me personally, did the practice of my life, my own spiritual journey, my own journey toward Christ, seem to fall so woefully short uh, in my personal life of what I was doing publicly? Let me explain. I had started writing some books which sold very well in the evangelical community, and I was helping my father, who at that time was becoming quite known in the Protestant world. And uh, you might have turned on your TV set oh, uh, 10, 12 years ago and seen me uh, for a week on uh, something like the 700 Club, talking about uh, whatever it might be, issues of the sanctity of human life like abortion or whatever. I was part of that subculture. And yet, for me personally, confession and accountability, repentance, really came down to not much more than a muttered, lonely prayer in, into my pillow at three in the morning. I wasn't really accountable to anyone other than myself and my own conscience and theoretically God. But oddly enough, uh, because of this lack of accountability, uh, uh, God always seemed to be leading me to do what I wanted to anyway and uh, what I was going to do. And often my Christianity became no more than a blessing on my own ego because there wasn't really a structure to which I belonged. Now, from an orthodox position, and of course I didn't see this at the time, but in hindsight, this is because the idea of having uh, your priest uh, be your spiritual father, someone you're accountable to, someone you confess to, someone who will say, now what have you done about this particular issue? How have you changed your life in this regard? Of course, all that was missing from my Protestant Christian experience. Uh, my times with a pastor came down to little more than some kind of Christian psychological counseling, you might say. There wasn't any real authority there. And if I happened not to like what that person was telling me, I was free to go up the block to another, quote, church, because this is a sectarian culture. 
uniquely so there is no such thing as the church in contemporary american culture you can just go up the street to the next guy that hangs out a shingle calling it whatever a church until you find one that tells you what you want to hear quote unquote feeds you and if i didn't like what that particular pastor was saying i could change denominations or go to a bible church that was totally cut off from any accountability and if worse came to worse you as a protestant as you all know are free to just go start your own group call yourself a pastor self promote whatever you want to do there really is not a structure or a tradition to which you are accountable now i wasn't thinking things out to that degree or in that regard at that time but this personal sense of a lack of accountability this personal sense of drifting uh, cut off from anything greater than what I had in my own mind or what I could read in or out of context out of scripture or what somebody told me in a Bible study or a prayer meeting or what some pr uh, preacher said in a sermon <clears throat> nevertheless this kind of smorgasbord Christianity like a supermarket take this off the shelf leave that a little bit of this a little bit of that no matter how sincere one is in that type of a Christian life it finally comes down to your own ego because it is me, me, me. I'll take this teaching. I'll believe this verse. I'll think of Christ in this way. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll go to this teacher. I'll read that book. One is not accountable in a situation like that. And one only needs to think of one's own children, if your parents, to know that that is not accountability. In a family, the position of the father and mother is not one the child elects its parents too. They are the parents whether the child likes it or not. And a family is not a democracy. If the television set is going to be turned off, the child in a family, a real family, a good family, a Christian family, is not free to say, well, I'll just find another parent that'll let me turn it on. <laughs> um, and wander up the block, stopping at this neighbor's house and that neighbor's house until they find a more accommodating parent for that night. We all know that that's not accountability. Accountability means structure. It means someone has a role. It is a hierarchy. It is an archetype of the hierarchy of God and creation, where beginning with the least subatomic particle all the way through the whole of creation up to the very throne of God, there is a hierarchy of accountability. And so this kind of democratic American approach to Christianity, for which Frank Sinatra has written the anthem, which is, I'll do it my way, <laughs> Um, leaves one somewhat drifting. And in my case, I was drifting in the sense that my own sense of a lack of walking toward Christ or changing those terrible things we all bear, these great sins we have in our souls, being ruled by our passions, the sense that I was making no headway in that, in spite of all the foldy roll and smoke and fire and so forth, of Christian activity that I was involved with, making Christian movie, going on the 700 Club, going on a lecture tour with my father, I began to wonder, is this all there is? And if so, then I'm in trouble. You know, it was the Groucho Marx syndrome. Remember what Groucho Marx said? He said that he'd never want to become a member of any club that would let someone like him join. <laughs> well, I began to suffer from the same thing because in a way, you know, writing some quote-unquote Christian bestsellers and suddenly having people asking me for answers to things when I knew full well that I in turn was accountable to no one is the same position that a father would be in, for instance, who's trying to tell his teenage daughter not to take drugs if he's secretly going up to his bedroom every night snorting up a line or two of cocaine. Pretty soon you would say, well, what am I passing on here? I am myself not accountable to anyone. I'm just out there drifting. Um, if the buck stops with me as a kind of a self-appointed Christian leader without any structure around me, then what is all this made out of? How do I know that any of these guys who are leading the Bible studies are saying anything ascribed to anything greater than I do? Because I'm certainly not doing that well. And these were inner doubts and inner thoughts. In a more exterior sense, a more philosophical, historical sense, I also began to have another series of nagging problems. You see, as part of what had been known as the new religious right, not so much politically, but in terms of moral issues, there was a kind of triumphalism in the late 70s and early 80s, if you will remember back, those of you who remember. Christian TV was going from late night UHF stations, you know, 
Channel 98 somewhere, to uh, owning their own satellites and blanketing the nation, if not the world. Evangelical publishing was coming out of the church basement, and in, instead of being a mom and pop operation, the CBA, the Christian Booksellers Association, was rivaling the ABA, the American Book Association, and all of a sudden becoming a $3 billion industry, and Christian bookstores were big business. There was this sense that evangelicalism was undergoing a new rebirth in America. Church growth was up, Christian TV was happening, Ronald Reagan was about to get elected, and we were marching forward. And if one listened to all the statistics and hyperbole from all the various evangelistic groups, whether from Campus Crusade or Billy Graham or Pat Robertson, if you added up all the people they all claimed to have seen saved in their ministries in those years, America would have been saved two or three times over. Uh, there weren't enough people to share all those statistics. And you had the sense of forward momentum and marching. And the explanation for the problems in our culture, the fact that a third of the babies uh, conceived were being aborted and 50% of the marriages were ending in divorce and our school system was more adept at teaching children how to use condoms than how to read. These were explained as being part of a secular humanist conspiracy, if you like, where somehow the ACLU and the National Organization of Women had spoiled this nice American country of ours that until they came in with their alien ideas had been pristine and wonderful. And we had founding documents that used the name of God and Christ to prove we were a, quote, Christian nation. And to a certain extent, I bought into this until I began to do a little thinking and a little reading and a little study. And I soon understood that if you really look at American history, this weird mixture of Protestant millennialism in the Puritan and Quaker form combined with French Enlightenment philosophy, and I talk a lot about this incidentally in my book Dancing Alone if you're interested, you soon find that this great city set on the hill was the first truly sectarian Protestant country in the world because the European countries had always had ideas of the church going back to Roman Catholicism and then in their state churches, Lutheranism in Germany and Sweden, for instance, Roman Catholicism in Portugal and Italy. But this truly first Protestant experiment, this sectarian nation with this national civil religion of humanistic Protestantism and humanistic Christianity mixed with the pure humanism of the Enlightenment that came through people like Jefferson and Ben Franklin and others, this experiment was really flawed from the very beginning. And all the people who were groaning and moaning about the terrible thing the 1960s generation had done somehow forgot that those kids came out of homes in the 50s and their parents in turn out of the 40s. And when you followed it back, the problems in contemporary American civilization did not start with a bunch of secular Jews in New York. They did not begin with some fist-in-your-face feminist at Wellesley, they began when the Founding Fathers stepped off the boat and it went from there. And if you read John Winthrop's diary of the Bay State Colony, as I did at that time, when I began to do some of this studying for myself, for my own knowledge, you find that 30 to 40 percent of his diary is taken up with what? This city set on a hill. Taken up with the heresy trials and the schisms in a group that numbered less than a thousand people at the beginning that even there, there were denominational splits. People were thrown out of the colony because they didn't toe the line. They didn't have the right theology. Uh, right from the beginning, there was no there, there. You know, we're in Southern California. I come from the East Coast. We love to say there's no there, there in Los Angeles. Well, certainly from the very beginning in American history, this great millennial Puritan city set on a hill, there was no there, there. There were warring theological, cultural factions from the beginning. Why? Because the sectarian Protestant idea says that you have nothing but your own conscience in the Bible, that there is no such thing as the holy tradition, there is no such thing as the church, there is not a hierarchy that was left in place by Christ in the apostles who went out and ordained other uh, ministers of the gospel to carry on in an orderly manner the tradition from the beginning. There is no there there, and so this humanistic secular mess that we call relativism and, and that we call secularism. This problem where there is no idea of absolute truth and one person says, well, I want to live the homosexual lifestyle. And you say, well, I think that's wrong. And they say, well, that's fine for you. Then you go have a traditional marriage, but we're each free to do whatever we want. This relativism we see in the schools, 
This did not start with some pagan or secular or atheistic plot. This comes right out of the heart of sectarian Protestantism. Why? Well, obviously, no one foresaw this. But when you say that Christianity is no more than your conscience in the Bible, what you're really saying is that Christianity is no more than the individual conscience. Why? Because the reformers may have said sola scriptura, the Bible only. But in the end, who's interpreting that scripture? The individual. And so really what you're talking about is not sola scriptura, the Bible alone, sola means alone, but simply sola, or perhaps the old Italian song, O solo mio. <laughs> because in the end, the fact of the matter is, According to the 1989 UN statistics, there are now 23,000 Protestant denominations that have come out of the sectarian American Protestant experience mainly, with an average of five new ones forming a week. And so Andy Warhol once told us that every American will be famous for 15 minutes in the TV age of 100 cable stations. Well, he may or may not be right, but it looks like every American's going to have his own denomination for 15 minutes. And we are a country of migratory spirituality. We keep joining new churches and journeying and so on and reforming and combining and splitting. For me, I remember as a child, if you had said, what's church history? I did not think of Byzantium and the great sweep of the church. For me, church history was the history of my particular denomination that had split in the 1950s from its parent denomination, which itself was an offshoot of another Protestant denomination. In my case, it was all in the Presbyterian part of the evangelical milieu, but it could have been Baptist or anything else. And so in my novel, Portofino, one of the little running gags I have is that this little boy keeps trying to keep track of the acronyms, the PCUSA, the PCCCUSA, the PCUSAC, whatever. <laughs> he can't remember what they're part of anymore. Because even in his short life, it has been split, reconfigure, leave, travel, go, look, search. But of course, this was nothing to do with religion only. This is the price you pay in a sectarian society. You don't like Cleveland, upstakes, leave your half-finished building, head for Denver. That doesn't work out, go to the West Coast. When you've trashed your little plot of land here, move on. The nation that was adept at finding ways to build a new plow was also adept at finding ways to have new religions. And you know, we not only have sectarian Protestantism, we have sectarian religiosity to the point where you have everything from Mormonisms to the Jehovah's Witness and the rest coming up with their own scriptures, their own instant American traditions where now Christ shows up to talk to Native Americans because you have your own homegrown version. This is a nation of homegrown everything. Remember, the national anthem is, I did it my way. This is the nation of individualism. This is the nation that if you wanted to draw up a plan for a culture as far away from the traditions of Christianity as you could when it comes to responsibility, accountability, community, tradition, changeless, non-negotiable truth, surely this is the culture you would design. And so for me, in looking at that question combined with my own sense of a lack of progress in my own life spiritually, I really, at one point, about, oh, 12, 15 years ago, began to say, look, enough is enough. I'm not getting very far with my own spiritual life. The culture that supposedly has been built on Christianity, if you believe fundamentalist Protestant mythology, is not a Christian culture at its core. I'm going around the country trying to call people back to being good God-fearing Americans. What happens if there never were any? And that when you call people back, quote unquote, you're simply, to use this analogy, calling people back to the 1950s out of the 1960s. But of course, the 1950s will always give birth to the 1960s because middle class American pietistic civil religion always will breed rebels who finally say, why should I put up with this? You have to understand there's no use going back to an earlier stage of a corrupt system. If you go back into Hitler's Germany and you say, well, if we just could go back to 1931 instead of, instead of 1935 or 1940, of course, you're just going to the earlier stage of the Nazi anti-Semitic crusade. As a man thinketh, so is he. When the seeds of the idea are there, the problem is already there in its infancy. We all know that. 
And so I began to wonder if there wasn't something more for my own Christian life in the area of accountability, confession, worship, sacrament. Why did Christianity have to be so trivialized? Why did it have to always seem as if you were making it up as you go along, reinventing the wheel? Music in your church is something somebody decided to write on Friday night with the guitar. They probably shouldn't have even taken the guitar up to begin with. They're no good at it. But <laughs> your liturgy is this kind of instant liturgy of personal conscience. It's the Monday morning women's Bible study version of Christianity. Whatever Jesus laid on my heart, I'll just spout out as thus saith the Lord. It's the Friday night pastor preparing his sermon because unlike an Orthodox church where he's facing the altar and he's not putting on a show for the people, but rather leading the priesthood of all believers in worship, the sermon becomes a show. Spirituality is the feeling you have after a good sermon. The music is supposed to fill you somehow emotionally and give you that lift. And I kept wondering, well, why so trivialized? Why so hollow? Where is the dignity? Where is the glory? Where is the honor? Where is the worship? Where is the still small voice in all these entertainments we call worship today? And when you start asking questions, sometimes you find unexpected answers. And for me, one of them was simply that there came a time when I could no longer go around the country, whether in book form or film form or personally, spouting a party line that I really didn't believe anymore. I was in the position of Gorbachev in the last years of the Soviet Union. He understood that it was a bankrupt system, and yet he had to go through the motions for a few more years because he, he was still in the position of prime minister. Well, I felt very much the same. And at a certain point, even someone like me, uh, it's a very high threshold I have for hypocrisy, but at a certain level, <laughs> you, you don't want to go anymore if you can help it. And so you begin to try to think, how do I find some distance from this situation long enough, find some distance long enough to find a way back or forward or sideways, but anywhere beyond where I am now. And I realized I couldn't do that simply forging ahead. I remember during that period of time, I had an invitation to deliver a speech to a very large gathering, the, the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention. And there were 23,000 Southern Baptist pastors there um, in this kind of sea of pale blue, you know. Uh, we, this was in the summer somewhere, and it's a lot of polyester in one, one building. <laughs> that was... That's somewhat naughty, and I have to say, in the late 1970s, we were all guilty of this sin, you know. It's not, I probably had on a leisure suit, I don't know. So I'm not casting aspersions, we were all in the same boat, but <clears throat> terrible, terrible fashions. I don't think that's ever coming back somehow, but never mind. But I remember standing there talking away and holding forth, and I had a kind of a subtext in my own mind at the same time, which simply was saying to myself, yeah, this little voice kept saying, but you don't believe a word of this. Now, I am not talking about a loss of faith. This was not an atheist talking about Christianity. I believed in God and Christ, and the faith taught me at my mother's knee, if you like. But this whole thing, this great march forward, the evangelical world, that somehow this was going to bring enlightenment to America. If we could just sign up another 10,000 people for the 700 Club or get another 50,000 marching in this particular pro-life thing or doing that or the other, that we'd solve the problem and call America back to God. That's the part I really didn't believe in. Because for me, calling people back to an earlier stage of a declining civilization doesn't solve anything. And especially if in your own heart, Confession is a lonely, muttered prayer into your pillow at 3 in the morning. The sacraments are something you don't have much understanding of. The church just means the building down the road, and you're out there twisting in the wind alone with your sin and passions with no real guidance at all. Then it simply isn't enough. And so, as I say, I have a high threshold for hypocrisy, but there came a time when I couldn't go down this road any further. And at that time, I was running a ministry called Schaefer Productions that had made these evangelical documentaries like How Should We Then Live and Whatever Happened to the Human Race and so on. And, and we were a fairly substantial company and a nonprofit organization. And we just simply 
drew the line under it and i said this is it i can't do it close the doors and ironically we had just sent a fundraising letter out and so what we did is we simply returned all the envelopes on opened with a note saying you shape of productions has ceased to exist we left a lot of very bemused donors out there no one sends the check back and but we did and we just simply folded our tent closed the door we had a mailing list of one hundred eighty five thousand people at that time and they said what do we do with the mailing list and i said wipe it off the computer and sell the equipment. And that was the end of Schaefer Productions. Because I wasn't going to go around basically uh, proselytizing for something I didn't believe in. So the great thing about that was is that I became instantly broke, which was uh, interesting, <laughs> uh, with three children. And I also became instantly unemployed, which gave me time to do some reading. And so I took the next five years to study things that I should have been taught many years before but never was. And it was that course of study that is reflected in the book uh, Dancing Alone in that it brought me uh, through an uh, intellectual historical journey into the Orthodox Church. And I want to end today's session by simply saying this. I found a few key points that I go into detail in in my books, uh, but here is what that comes down to. For the first time in my life, I began to read some real church history, not a 19th century or 20th century Protestantized version, but real church history. Eusebius's fourth century history of the church. Eugira's diary of a pilgrimage to the Holy Land that she wrote in the third century. This woman from Spain talking about what she found in the Pascha week, the holy services uh, in the church there in Jerusalem. And what I began to find with those readings and the readings of some of the patristic fathers and the anti-Nicene fathers and others, Irenaeus of Lyon, Ignatius of Antioch, and all the others, those who heard the disciples with their own ears or were the second generation after, those that, as the church says, had the words of the apostles ringing in their ears, what I found in reading the church history of the real early church astounded me. Because I found that what was there bore no relationship to what somehow I thought must have been the case from my kind of Protestant experience. I had always pictured kind of Protestant Christians like us in the early church before it got all corrupted and overlaid with human tradition. And then the church kind of faded away for 15 centuries. I don't know where everyone went. And then all of a sudden, Martin Luther rediscovered the church. And then here are all our reformer heroes and others, and then there's my little denomination, and then, hey, presto, the great gift of God to the world, American evangelical Christianity. But in reading the real church history, which is accessible to everyone, uh, this isn't, you know, you, you, I'm not a scholar, and you certainly don't have to be one to read Eusebius or Eugira. It's very simple. Uh, the same with the writings of people like Irenaeus or Ignatius. Ignatius' letters, for instance, to the seven churches in Asia that he wrote on the way to his martyrdom in the arena in Rome. This is accessible material. What did I find? I found something very different than what I thought would be there. First of all, I found a hierarchy and a structure. Ignatius says in his letters in the year 110 that if you do not honor the bishop as you would Christ, in other words, if you don't have structure, if the buck doesn't stop somewhere, you are going to have chaos and lose the faith. Well, that made some sense to me. In a day and age in which if a pastor sleeps with his secretary and the church throws him out, he's free to go down the road and start a new denomination, and probably will, and keep right on as if nothing's happened. It made sense to me that somewhere you need hierarchy. It made sense to me personally, because in my own life, when I looked at my own sins, my many, many sins, I realized that one of my problems was is that even adults need a father. You never grow up. You are always a naughty child. And someone needs to know what the score is and wander in and say, look, Frank, you can't do this anymore. And if you do, you can't take communion because you can't come ill prepared to the table of the Lord unless you want to eat and drink death to yourself. So don't take communion for six months until you've worked this out in your life. Come back next week and talk to me about it again. And you're not free to just wander down the street to another, quote, denomination where someone will soft talk you and build up your ego. I often say about America that our national pastime is having a sense of high self-esteem for no reason. <laughs> this, is why, this is why we live in a culture with a, with a functional illiteracy rate higher than the U.S. had in 1870. I'm not kidding you, because people tell kids 
have a high self of sense of steam you're great you're wonderful like some crazy motivational speaker regardless of the fact that you're not doing your homework and can't read and can't think the idea of self esteem used to be first of all from the church's point of view that humility is the way to Christ anyway and that if you do have a sense of self worth it is rooted in who God made you to be not yourself or your achievements and that if one is to if one is to have any sense of accomplishment it used to be that one had to actually do something to have this so for me one of the things I discovered about the early church is it was hierarchical what a heresy in America to discover a hierarchy of any kind when this is the country that says there's not only to be no king but no bishops no priests no one in charge of anything beyond the quiet of will of the people but yet here was a hierarchical institution from the very beginning wherein Christ is telling the disciples in the Gospel of John just as his ascending into heaven that the sins you forgive will be forgiven and those you retain will be retained and Peter in the book of Acts in the Jerusalem Declaration is saying it seems good to us in the Holy Spirit and Paul after his conversion experience on the Emmaus Road does not head off and start a Pauline evangelistic ministry he goes to Jerusalem and submits in humility to the Apostles and he is sent out in good order by the hierarchy of the early church he does not just step out any more than I am here speaking on my own shtick today the only reason I'm here speaking today is because a number of years ago I went to my bishop who's Methodius in Boston I said I'm getting these speaking invitations do I have your permission to take them and he gave me his blessing and said go out and speak because that is what it means when you are in the Orthodox and the true historical church you're not on your own you do answer to someone the other thing I found about the historic church is that what it meant to be a Christian now remember what I said when I introduced this topic listen to my words here I'm not saying what it meant to become a Christian I'm not judging the faith of anyone but what it meant to be a Christian boiled down to three very basic things and it wasn't some airy fairy feeling that you had Jesus in your heart <laughs> you find none of that in the historic church no one's saying they are a Christian because they have Jesus in their heart what it meant to be a Christian was three very measurable things, like three columns holding up a facade of a building or a three-legged stool. It meant, one, that you believed certain things, and this was called doctrine. And when someone deviated from that belief, they called a great council of the church to denounce them as heretics. And that's why we have things such as the doctrine of the Trinity. That's why we have things such as the doctrine of the two natures of Christ, that he was fully God and fully man. Why? Because the church set them down in dogmatic fashion, in writing, at councils, not because these were new inventions, but because these ideas had to be defended by the hierarchical institution of the church, the bishops, against heresy. Or it would become every man and woman for themselves alone with their scripture, interpreting it any way they want. In fact, Irenaeus speaks against that very phenomenon. He says to the heretic who's writing to him in a great letter exchange that we still have, he says, well, I'm using the scripture, too, to prove my viewpoint. And Irenaeus says to him, listen, the heretic is like someone who finds a wonderful mosaic of a king made out of precious jewels. And he takes the mosaic home, and he pulls the jewels out, and rearranges it into a new picture, and yet claims it's authentic because the jewels are authentic. It's only the context in which the jewels appear that gives them their final meaning. And the context of scripture is the church out of which the scriptures came. Did you know there was no New Testament for the first 300 years of the early church? By a lot of Protestant definitions, that makes Peter and Paul and John non-Christians because we say our faith is based on the Bible. They didn't have a Bible. What on earth did they believe in then? They be believed in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's what they passed on. And the cart cannot be put in front of the horse. The reason we have the New Testament is because the church said it's the New Testament. Why? Because it conformed to the teaching of the apostles from the beginning. I'm often amused by this anecdotal story where someone talks about this Baptist pastor. Boy, we're picking on the Baptist today, excuse me. <laughs> but don't worry, in the last three next two talks, I'll pick on the Orthodox. So <laughs> write the record here. But where a Baptist pastor says, well, if the King James Version of the Bible was good enough for Christ and the apostles, it's good enough for me. <laughs> 
you, the problem is, the problem is, yeah, the problem here says he used to be a Baptist. The problem is it didn't exist. But what existed was the truth. You know someone says, what do you believe? I believe in the Bible. Let me tell you something. I do not believe in the Bible. I believe in Christ. The Bible tells me about Christ and I trust it because the whole church has borne witness to the veracity of the Gospels from the first day. That's why the martyrs died. That's what we trust and believe in. We have to get the order right. And so I found that the church was certainly there before the New Testament. The New Testament came out of the church as Irenaeus said to the heretic who says, well then how do you know what books are the holy writings? They weren't even calling it a New Testament then. He said, because they have been in the most ancient churches from the beginning. Someone says to me, well, you're the son of the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer. We have this, this new manuscript here that this publishing house purports to be an, an unpublished posthumous work by your father. And I say, it's not authentic. How do you know? Well, not because I quote you a chapter, a verse, or a feeling in my heart. I'll tell you how I know. Because I was playing with my train set on the floor in his study when he read and wrote and worked. Because I was there. Because in my attic, there's a trunk of old manuscripts, and they're dated, and they fill the years that he was writing. And they are the authentic works of Francis Schaeffer. Not because of a theological theory, but because I was there, I was an eyewitness. And that is what the tradition of the church is. It is simply no more than that that has been believed by everyone everywhere from the beginning. So Irenaeus says, how do I know what's in the New Testament? Because the church in Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, they've had these manuscripts from the beginning. That's how. It's no big fancy theological idea. It's certainly no, quote, spiritual idea. It's the same way that an atheistic Jewish anthropologist knows what the New Testament is. Whether he or she believes in it is a moot point. But they certainly know what the authentic texts are because they can go and see what the scriptures were in the Church of Alexandria. The records have been very well kept. Why one book is in and another out. And so I found that this idea of doctrine in the early church was something that everyone from an illiterate peasant in third century Carthage to a great Byzantine scholar of the 12th century would have agreed on. They might have formulated it slightly differently, but. They understood the virgin birth, the two natures of Christ, that God existed, that Christ rose from the dead. These are the basic teachings of Christianity. And you couldn't just call yourself a Christian because you had a warm, fuzzy feeling you had to believe these things. And the second point, the second leg of the stool, was moral behavior. What does that mean? Well, there was a tradition in the church of what it meant to be a Christian. And you could say the creed every morning till you were blue in the face, but if your business was running an abortion clinic, and you had abandoned your wife and three children, and they were starving in the street. No matter how often you went to church, sooner or later, your priest or your bishop or a holy and pious monk or nun or a fellow believer in the priesthood of all believers would come up to you and say, Friend, it's great you say you believe all this stuff about the resurrection and the virgin birth. But to be a Christian, what it means to be one in a proactive sense, is not to live in this way. You are accountable to a certain tradition, and you are either going to have to repent and change, not perfectly, or we would not have the sacrament of confession, because you only have to confess once and you change, but you have to walk in another direction, because what it means to be a Christian is not just doctrine. And the third leg of the stool surprised me the most, because as a Protestant, I knew least about it. And yet, ironically, it was the least disputed tradition in the church. And that was worship. To be a Christian did not mean that you worshipped any way you wanted. The church defended its sacraments from the beginning. Paul tells us if we come in properly to the table of the Lord, we are condemning ourselves. The tradition was non-negotiable of what Christian worship was. It did not come from outer space. It was built on the tradition of Judaism. We don't read that Paul and Jesus and Peter made up worship as they went along. Think about it for a minute. Christ goes into the synagogue. What does he read? The Lord himself does not read the, quote, verse laid on his heart. Read scripture. He read the passage for the day. 
It was liturgical. It was orderly. You couldn't just grandstand. The pastor was not L leader who can make it up as he goes along. There's the passage for the day, and then there's the passage not for that day. Christ obeyed the liturgical rules of the day. Peter, in the Christian era, after the resurrection, what do we read? He's going to the synagogue to pray. What? He's going to pray the ninth hour prayers. He's keeping the tradition that he was given. Christian worship that you read about in Eusebius's History of the Church or Eugairi's Diary of a Pilgrim, what do you discover? You discover worship that has a liturgy, that has a form in which the preacher is not grandstanding, is not the center of attention, but the priesthood of all the believers follows a certain path and everyone is facing the altar. Read Eusebius's festal oration at the dedication of the church in Tyre in the fourth century, if you don't believe me, the description that he says of what the new church building is like, including an iconostasis, by the way, would astound you because it's a description of contemporary orthodoxy. So little has that changed. Now, liturgical tradition evolved like all human things do. But the non-negotiable essentials of that tradition, the fact that the prayers of the church go back into the Old Testament era, the prayers of the people are still the Psalms of David, the fact that the readings for the day and the idea of a liturgical year and a, and a spiritual calendar that molded the rest of your life, this comes out of the very beginnings of the church. So much so that the Roman historian Philo in the first century in his report to the Roman Senate on the Christian church in Carthage talks about a dispute between the Christians there. So you know it must be true because they're already arguing. <laughs> on what? On whether to keep the Lenten fast strictly for the full 40 days or just Holy Week. <coughs> That's not what you would call an unsophisticated primitive church. We're already talking about church calendar and liturgical practice. So much so that Paul tells us to defend the sacraments and that those that come unworthily eat and drink damnation to themselves. And the most common thread running through the New Testament is the idea of the breaking of bread. If you read any good history of liturgics, you will find that a lot of it goes back into the Old Testament. Well, of course it does, because God builds with human tools. He used the virgin's womb, an amniotic sac, breast milk, the cross, wine, oil. He did not come down with a golden tablet like the Book of Mormon from outer space. He redeemed the human race with the very stuff of the physical creation that he gave us. He redeemed the world around us. And this is why we dare to come with the bread and the wine and say that Christ's very presence is in it. Because lowly and humble as these things are, they are the stuff of which Christ came to redeem. We are not afraid of the physical world. Christ redeemed that world with the very tools he had made. And so you find from the very beginning that this tradition of worship in the Orthodox and Christian tradition is as non-negotiable as is the moral teaching of the church and the scripture itself. And it's not a free-for-all to be made up by the pastor's wife while she composes a new song on Friday night. And it's not a free-for-all where worship can be this for a post-Vatican II Roman Catholic as they, uh, as they have a kind of a, a 1960s Peter, Paul, and Mary liturgy and the guitar playing goes and the altar's ripped out, or down here at the other end, the charismatic church down the block, or up here, the, the Presbyterian church, four white walls and a sermon, and everyone in a pluralistic sectarian culture says, oh, well, you're free to worship as you want. Well, not according to the historic church, you're not. According to the historic church, if you have schism and chaos in the area of liturgy, then you have cut to the quick of what the Christian tradition has to offer. And you have abandoned that wisdom of the centuries that has added constructively to that liturgical tradition piece by piece. And so you look, for instance, at the liturgy of James, the first apostle of Jerusalem, called the brother of our Lord, and you look at the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, and you look at the liturgy of John Chrysostom, you do not find a total break. Just as in the early reports of worship in the early church, you find Peter still going to keep the ninth hour prayers in the synagogue, you don't find a total break. It was the Christians who were cast out of the synagogue, or we'd be worshiping there till this day, having also incorporated the Christian elements of sacramental practice, which is what came in 
And so that is the history you find. And when I did this little bit of reading after that five-year period, and I'll conclude now, and we'll pick up in the next talk, what I found is that my picture of what it meant to be a Christian, one last time, like a broken record, not what it meant to become a Christian, because who can judge the heart of the thief on the cross, but what it meant to be a Christian in an active sense, in the same way that it practically means to be married, that you live with one woman, and you have children, and you're the father, and she's the wife, you're faithful to her. That's what it means to be married. Well, similarly, it meant something to be a Christian. And so for those who come from a Protestant background, I'll leave you with a little analogy to chew over, and then I'll take some questions. And perhaps this sums up where I was at that point. Just before I came into the Orthodox Church, began to discover Orthodox worship itself. It occurred to me that this might illumine what I'm saying. You meet someone sometime, and they tell you, I am from France. Well, my reaction is to say, too bad, but that's different. <laughs> I, excuse, I grew up in Switzerland, and we didn't like the French. The French don't like the Germans, and that's just my European uh, nationalism coming out. But if you're feeling polite that day, which in my case is a 50-50 toss of a coin, you say, you don't say that's too bad, uh, my, or you know, even worse, my condolences. Uh, <laughs> You say, where are you from in France? And if this person says, oh, well, I've never actually been to France. <laughs> then you say, well, that's interesting. So you mean you had French parents, just like I'm an American because my parents were American. I was born in Switzerland. I'm da, da, da. No, no, my, my mother's Irish. My dad's German. Oh, that's interesting. But you, are, you say you're French. Oh, yeah, I'm French to the core. <laughs> so you rack your mind and you think, oh, I get it. They were on vacation in a French protectorate, a Polynesian island, mother delivered in the French embassy. It's one of these weird deals. <laughs> so you say, oh, you mean you were born in a French protectorate? No. Then you think wildly, well, wait a minute, airspace? Were they on Air France? <laughs> <laughs> so you go down through the list and you say at the end, trying not to appear rude. Well, I'm somewhat perplexed. You, you haven't been to France. You weren't born in France. Your parents aren't French. You weren't born in a French protectorate. Um, what exactly is it that makes you French? And if their answer is this, well, I feel French in my heart. <laughs> I feel like I belong to France. I've accepted France. <laughs> You'll have to turn to them and say, well, listen, let me tell you something. I've, I've done a lot of travel in the course of my life, and I know France pretty well, and I just have a word of advice for you. If you fly to Orly Airport without a passport and with no documentation, and the French douane, the custom agent, says to you, what are you doing trying to get into France? And you tell them that you have accepted France into your heart. You are going to be on the next plane back or worse, because... They're going to want to know where you're from, your birth certificate, and your passport. Now, what's the analogy? Not salvation. Because we walk by the light we're given. But it is the church. One is either in the historic church or one is not. And how do we see this? Well, let's take one harsh example in a very negative light. Ananias and Sapphira could have lied to Peter about a lot of things. And they would have just had it on their conscience. But when they lied to the church, rather than to the local PTA or to Peter's role as the, uh, as the local basketball coach or whatever, when they lied about what they were giving to God in the church, then the authority of the church was an immovable object. It wasn't a feeling in their heart. And they were carried out feet first. It was not a game. When you travel from one place to another in the historic church, and you walked into a new Orthodox church, a new church, and you said to the priest, I'm a Christian, so I want to take communion. He'd say, I'm glad you're a Christian. That's great. But if you're going to take the sacrament of communion here, this was the practice of the church through the whole world, by the way, then you're going to need one of three things. One. A letter from your bishop saying that not only are you a Christian, but that you can receive the sacraments because you have been to confession and you are living a Christian life. You have to be accountable. We don't want you carried out feet first. 
If you can't produce that, then two godly witnesses from our community who we know who knew you in your town. But we know them, and so we have reason to trust their word. And if you can't produce that, then you have to stay here and live a godly, orderly, disciplined Christian life for three years, and then you can receive communion. But we have to know who you are, because I, as the priest defending this sacrament, can't simply wave a wand over you and say, you're, you know, you're in number 441. You've got to either come this way, this way, or this way. The equivalent is, in our day, if you came to an Orthodox priest and said, I want to be Orthodox, he's not going to say, fine, sign the book. He's going to say, this is the way you must come. You've got our inquiry class. You learn this, this, and this. He talks to you and at his discretion finds out what you already know. He's got to know who you are. This isn't some quickly done thing. Why? Because the church has always defended its worship, its sacraments, and its authority from the beginning. And it's not messed up to the individual's feeling. We're all very bad judges about ourselves. A lot of the time, I feel I'm doing fine. But my priest, my wife, my children, they can tell you the truth. <laughs> Who, left to their own devices, does very well? I certainly don't. I won't speak for you, but I need some accountability. <clears throat> I need it in every area of life. My wife has to tell me, don't send this draft of the manuscript to your agent. Wait three months and read it again. There's a lot of problems in here. And I get furious. I say, no, it's perfect. I can send it today. It's done. <laughs> She says, wait, you're going to be sorry. I wait, I read it, and I say, did I write this? <laughs> How could you even let me get close to thinking this book? <laughs> so she gets blamed either way, of course. <laughs> and so I would say that when you look at the historic and early church, you find doctrine, you find accountability or morals, and you find worship. And I'll start my next talk by telling you how I personally came into the Orthodox Church in the sense of what the step was for me personally from reading about some of these things to being chrismated as an Orthodox. But we will leave this session where it is, and I'll ask you if there's just a couple of questions, and then we'll have a break. Yes, there's a question here. Yes. For the benefit of the non-Orthodox in the audience, uh, you asked uh, who is Orthodox and who is not Orthodox. Right. I would recommend that you ask a further, further breakdown of the Orthodox into those who have chosen to be Orthodox. Sure. For Yeah, I would just, the, the question is, the comment is that, um, you know, who is Orthodox, who is not Orthodox, who's chosen to be Orthodox, who has been born into the Orthodox Church? Well, the way one comes into the Orthodox Church, again, is not a feeling. One goes through certain outward motions that we see with the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, he didn't just ride along in his chariot not understanding the pages. When one of the apostles came to him, the first thing he did was perform a sacrament. He said, that's great. You've been reading. You understand. You believe. You've got it in your heart. Now I'm going to baptize you. And by baptizing him, not only brought him into uh, the fold of the believers, but brought him into the first step of coming into the church. Uh, and the reverse, of course, is that then you have some authority structure that you were beholden to. Um, you're not just on your own anymore. So who is in the Orthodox Church? Well, someone that has been baptized and chrismated into the church. And Orthodox do that with their children at infant baptism, as the church has from the beginning. And they also do that for adults like me who come in late in life and all points in between. Who is living as an Orthodox Christian is a different question. It's the person who has come into the church and who is understanding the primal teaching of orthodoxy. What is the primal teaching of orthodoxy? What is the bedrock of orthodox faith? Well, I may not put this in very good words, but it seems to me it can be summed up like this, and that is that salvation is a journey. The person born into the church who thinks that they had a magic wand waved over them and that's it, they're in, is literally living in a delusion according to the fathers. The person outside the church who thinks that they've just got Jesus in their heart and they go to Bible study every morning and they give 10% of their money to whatever church is also living in delusion because neither have it right. Yes, one comes into the church. But once in the church, one has to grow toward Christ. It becomes complex. Salvation is a journey. 
And we see that in Paul telling us to finish the journey. And we see that in the parable of the sower, telling us that, yeah, all these people had a born-again experience. Or you could say all these people were chrismated and baptized. You could give it any analogy you want. But they grew up in the heat of the day and they withered. Or their faith was plucked away by the evil one. Take it however you want. It's a journey. And so I'd say, how do you come into the Orthodox Church can be explained in fairly short order. One comes to a church, in these days one becomes a catechumen, an inquirer, that means you would come to some classes, you would take some lessons, you would begin to attend liturgy, you would find out what all this is about, you would do some reading, you would start talking to your priest, possibly even go to a first confession with him even before you were brought in, or at least talk to him in a very open way. But once in the Orthodox Church, having been baptized and having been chrismated, the journey then actually begins. And it's not a magic formula, and it's a one foot in front of the next. Every day, it's difficult, and one can go backward as well as forward. One can fall back the path and get back on it. Lastly, I would just say that the tools the church gives us to stay on that path are not psychological tools. It's not some feel-good tool. They're called the sacraments. The sacrament of penance and confession. The sacrament of baptism. The holy sacrament of marriage. The sacrament of the Eucharist, of communion. You see, each one builds on another. So if you see someone coming up to take the chalice here on Sunday morning, and this is an Orthodox church with a conscientious priest, you are also going to have to assume that he knows something about that person to some extent, in some way. And that if they're a member of the body here, that he's not going to let them just commune year after year after year after year while living in sin and unaccountable. Sooner or later, he's going to come to them and say, well, if I'm not your spiritual father, who is? Who are you going to confession with? Because it doesn't seem like your life in this community in any way is matching what you say you're doing, what you believe. And you can assume there's some accountability. And so the church itself, being in the church and growing toward Christ, actually then for the believer, start becoming one thing. Because one is in the church, one is taking the sacraments, which means one is accountable. If one's accountable, you're getting some help and, and you're no longer just talking to your pillow. And, uh, and you are looking at a person who, to whom you are going to have to give some answers because in the end we are going to have to give answers to Christ. So we might as well get in the habit of obedience and, of, and, and uh, confession now uh, rather than wait till we're before the throne of Christ and cast on his everlasting mercy, standing there naked, having in no way tried to learn how to live as a citizen of heaven while on earth. And so what does the church do through its sacraments? It helps us form the habits of mind that eventually will make heaven heavenly for us. Otherwise, we will hate it. And I'm not being facetious. If you take the egocentric, individualistic approach to Christianity, and you try to apply that in the heavenly kingdom, well, I can tell you, if you can't stand hierarchies here on earth, you're going to hate heaven. Because not only is it not democratic, there will be no theological debate. No one could care less what this verse means to you. And so what does the church do? The church is like a good basketball coach. I mean this seriously. It simply keeps setting you to going back to the free throw line and try again. Because you want to be Michael Jordan, you do not start by shooting the Nike commercial. You That's the Protestant way of doing it. You start in eighth grade at the free throw line and in the backyard with the basket on the garage. And if you won't do it there, you ain't doing it in the NBA. And it's no more complicated than that, but it's no easier than that either. Whether it's basketball or the Christian life, it's a journey. And the sacraments are the practice. They are the thing that bring us to God in his way, not our way. They are the lesson in humility. It doesn't matter how much theology you study, you're still going to have to come in his way. And so I was taught that lesson once very forcefully when I came to an Orthodox church soon after my, my coming into the church. And I said to the priest, but you know, something really bothers me. How can these little children be receiving the communion? This little baby who was on her mother's breast a moment ago, this child here walking up, they don't even know what it is. They don't even understand what they're doing. How can you possibly allow them to receive this sacrament when they don't understand? You know, there's the typical Protestant mind, chapter, verse, rationalism. And the priest looked at me and he said, do you understand what the sacrament of communion is? 
I had to say, well, no, not really. The church teaches it's a, it's a mystery. So he said, well, then recognize something. When you stand before God, you and the 18-month-old baby are both in the same position. In fact, that little girl may be ahead of you because your knowledge is a stumbling block. You have an illusion. You think you know something. At least she knows she doesn't. And it's not a coincidence that when it comes to the mysteries of faith, we are told by Christ, what are we told? We are told to become as little children. And the most beautiful sight in the world is that terrible equality before the Lord where all our pretensions are stripped away and the 80-year-old grandmother and the new convert and the two-year-old baby and the newborn child stand in the same line, they go through the same door, they come to the same Christ, and it really doesn't matter if you've read the 50 books or not. They will do you no good at that point. And that, to me, is how one travels through the Orthodox Church toward Christ. We are taught humility by the doing, not just the thinking of things. One more question, then. I was just wondering, did you have an opportunity to discuss this change in, in your thinking with your dad before he passed away? And if, if so or if not, or if, if so, what was his reaction? And if not, what do you think his reaction might sure. have been? Good question. The gentleman asked, did I have the opportunity before my father passed away in 1984 to discuss this change of heart? And if so, what did he say? And if not, what would he have said? Well, let me answer you. I was chrismated into the Orthodox Church at Christmas in 1990. My dad died in 1984. So I did not discuss coming into the Orthodox Church with my father because he had died. But I had talked about the first two-thirds of this talk, or the first half of my book, Dancing Alone, in that for the last 12 years before he died, I was becoming more and more and more restless, and my dad and I were best friends. We were collaborators. We worked. So I knew exactly where he was at, and, I, and he knew where I was at, and I would just point out to you that his last book that he wrote the year before he died was titled The Great Evangelical Disaster. My father was not a loyal and happy evangelical camper. He was most definitely disenchanted where, with, with where sectarian American Christianity had gone. He was not at a point of despair, personally, spiritually, but in terms of American Protestantism, he was. And he felt the game was over, and that the thing was cataclysmic. And what he said in private was 10 times stronger than what he wrote. My problem is I write what I say. <laughs> so I'm always in trouble. But Dad was more politic about these things. But if you had heard him in private, uh, anathematizing American evangelical Christianity and the whole of the Western Christian world, starting with the Reformation up to our present day, where did it finally lead, you'd know that Ironically, one of the people who influenced me the most greatly toward becoming Orthodox, not that he was there when I became Orthodox, was my father. Because he basically pre-evangelized with me to the Orthodox Church without knowing it. He was saying, we've lost our sense of the historic church. There's no accountability. Everybody's doing what they want, walking by the light of their own eyes. All these crazy independent Bible churches, you know, these charismatic, all the rest, they're insane. You cannot go out on your own and start a church. What has happened to the idea of apostolic succession? Because you see, the early Presbyterians still believed in that. What they didn't understand is it's like being halfway pregnant. You can't, you can't call for apostolic accountability and then say, well, yeah, but in our case, we don't actually have any connection to the apostles, but it's a great idea. Um, so if you read John Calvin, for instance, and you read his institutes, he talks about apostolic accountability. He talks about trying to stay in the, in the historic church, and he still claims he's in it. And uh, at the time, it might have sounded good, but later, as you see how his followers and disciples cut themselves off from everything, you realize it just doesn't work out. It's like the child saying, well, I'm obedient. I just don't happen to obey everything my parents said. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. You, you, little steps lead to big ones. In terms of my family, I guess the base answer would be my mother. Uh, she is living. We talk about things. We've had some arguments about orthodoxy. We've had some good talks about it. But she's moved from being one of those people who were shocked when I became Orthodox. Because there's plenty of Protestants out there grumbling about Protestantism. You don't meet very many Protestants who say, this is great, it's the way it ought to be. Um, go to any Protestant church and you'll be, you'll be home. There are, it's the other way around. Just go to my denomination and not even that because our denomination has three seminaries and two of them are awful so you can only go to a pastor who graduated from the third one and even they're not that good. So really, it's just Billy, Bob, and me. 
<laughs> and I'm not that sure about Billy Bob. <laughs> but for someone to actually jump up and say, okay, so now I'm going to change radically, then it's like, oh, well, I didn't know you were serious. But now, after the years have gone by, my mother has a great appreciation for the Orthodox Church and a tremendous growing sense that, for me, I've made a very good decision. Uh, her problem is, is when you're, when you're in your 80s and you've lived your whole life in another direction, um, I'm not at all sure you, she would follow me into the church, but put it this way, she's gone from shock and antipathy uh, to, uh, to uh, a great appreciation of orthodoxy and is doing some reading and so on, has some orthodox priests in her area that have become good personal friends of hers, often goes to liturgy, her excuse is, she says, I want to see what you're doing. Um, but I think she actually likes it, or she wouldn't keep going. So there's a, there's a tremendous warmth there. And that's basically been my experience with my own family. In uh, the Christian activist newspaper that I edit, and you can pick some cards up at the back, this next issue has an interview, a long interview with my brother-in-law, Udo Middleman, who runs the Francis Schaeffer Foundation and who is a, a professor at an evangelical school. And he, he and I have a good, lively discussion and debate in our pages, but his own feeling toward orthodoxy is certainly not one of hostility at this point. Um, so I would say that's been basically my experience. And then on the personal side, there are a lot of people I've just never heard from again. Uh, you know, someone said, well, what was it like in your, with your Protestant background to become orthodox? And I said, well, you know, have you ever heard of the late Ayatollah Khomeini? And they look at me saying, you know, where's he going with this? I said, well, just imagine that the late Ayatollah had a son and this son one day up and declared he was going to become a Jewish rabbi. Uh, how would that go down? Well, there's a lot of people, you know, uh, uh, that I don't hear from. Uh, the <laughs> so a couple of years after I became Orthodox, you know, it was the first year for a while I could get all my Christmas cards on one end of the mantle, you know. <laughs> And I'm talking about all facing out, too. <laughs> and one of them was, and one of them was from our local supermarket, um, wishing me well as a loyal customer. 